Good afternoon and welcome to CSIS. Um, as of tomorrow at 5 p.m., we're closing this building and moving to 1616 Rhode Island, effective next Monday. Uh, so this is the last event that the Global Health Policy Center is going to hold here in this building. I don't know if that's the same is true for the Middle East program, our, our co-host here, our partner here in putting this event together. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, our partners in pulling this all together. Uh, Rebecca Sirazi and Matt Fisher have both been uh, integral in, in organizing this, and uh, Haim Malka, uh, uh, director and deputy director of the Middle East program has also been very integral to this. And John Alterman, thank you for agreeing to to co-organize this. Uh, we did an event here uh, back in the spring on this subject of the hum human humanitarian crisis um, in Syria. Uh, Zahir Salul was with us at that time. Thank you for coming back, Zahir, uh, again. And uh, we thought uh, the time was very ripe now. Uh, to to have another roundtable discussion. I'm going to open with a few uh, brief remarks, and then I'm going to uh, we're going to move into a roundtable discussion, and I'll ask John Alterman to to kick things off in talking about the strategic U.S. interests, and we'll just move from this, and we'll uh, have our our participants uh, kick things off, and we'll go a couple of rounds of discussion, and then we'll open it to to you all for comments and questions. Um, since the August 21st chemical weapon attack on the Damascus suburb of Ghouta. We've all experienced the bewildering roller coaster debate over Syria, and we don't need to go into all the details and the twists and turns of that. But throughout that complex drama, which brought us over the weekend to the uh, framework agreement between the U.S. and Russia on destroying the chemical arsenal, chemical weapon arsenal, uh, throughout this complex drama, the looming human crisis, both within Syria and spilling across the region has been eclipsed. Uh, there's been woefully little reference to the human crisis uh, in international deliberations, uh, woefully little uh, consideration of its ex exceptional scale and ferocity, its root causes, and its possible future trajectory. Um, that includes consideration of the humanitarian impact should the war widen dramatically, the long-term sustainability and effectiveness of the international response and the deep and lasting changes to the region's demography, stability, and development, and whether, in fact, the Geneva Framework Agreement now creates a diplomatic opening uh, to begin to put forward uh, these major humanitarian access and protection issues. Before our speakers begin, a few comments on the, the nature of this overarching human crisis. In the first two and a half years, in the two and a half years since Syria's internal war commenced, in March 2011, almost one out of every three of Syria's 21.4 million citizens has paid a huge personal price in suffering and loss. There's 100,000 dead, almost 30,000 gone missing, an untold number wounded, 4.25 million forcibly displaced from their homes but struggling still inside Syria, 2 million who reached the profound decision to leave their country behind to flee to an uncertain, risky future in another country. A year ago, refugees numbered less than a quarter million. Over the course of 2013, more than 200 Syrians per month have fled to neighboring countries. That alarming pace has not slackened. By the official UN count, over 6.8 million Syrians are today in need of urgent humanitarian assistance. The true ag aggregate number, most observers agree, is far higher. UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Antonio Guterres, recently summarized the the crisis in, in, in Syria as a disgraceful humanitarian calamity with suffering and displacement unparalleled in recent history. The humanitarian burden, the demand, has reached unprecedented levels. The two UN appeals in 2013 amount to 4.4 billion. Uh, other country appeals bump that up to 5 billion. Uh, pledges have met less than half of those total amounts. As this grim picture uh, as grim as this situation appears, there have been a number of courageous personalities and institutions who've struggled against this catastrophe. Uh, the neighboring countries, Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon, Iraq, have at considerable cost and a risk allowed tens of hundreds of thousands of Syrians to enter their countries. UN agencies, OCHA under Valerie Amos, UNHCR under Antonio Guterres, have been exceptional performers in this period, as has the International Committee of the Red Cross, 
Syrian Arab Red Crescent, Médecins Sans Frontières, Syrian American Medical Society, and many other implementers. Commendably, the U.S. has been quick to respond generously and lead the humanitarian mobilization. From 2012 up to today, over the course of just 20, min 20 months, the U.S. commitment has exceeded $1 billion, roughly one-third of all international humanitarian commitments. Over half of that funding is directed inside Syria, the other half to the region, and an additional $250 million is going to non-lethal assistance to opposition groups. These commitments are striking and substantial, and we'll hear more from John about what this represents in terms of U.S. national interests. And they're coming in the midst of worsening U.S. budget constraints. They stretch our emergency budgets to their limits and potentially drain the U.S. capacity to respond to other new high-level demands. As the crisis deepens in Syria, we need to ask ourselves how the U.S. will begin to confront these tough budgetary trade-offs. Four other major dimensions to this. It, if you step back for a moment, the scale of Syria's human crisis inside Syria and the surrounding region clearly outstrips the financial and humanitarian response capacities of national governments, UN agencies, international organizations, local medical and relief societies, and international NGOs. That loose collection of humanitarian agencies is itself near the breaking point. Resources are insufficient, operational capacities fall short, and we, as we've seen, the horrendously difficult humanitarian access and protection problems inside Syria are at the very core of the human crisis. To a degree seldom seen in modern war, forces on all sides to Syria's internal war routinely obstruct the delivery of humanitarian aid, violate international humanitarian law and norms, and target and kill humanitarian workers. The, the highest burden of this, of course, is borne by uh, responsibility is the Assad regime itself, which bears overwhelming responsibility, but it is not alone. Moreover, in, in this period, inside Syria, there has been massive destruction of infrastructure in over a half a dozen major urban centers, and that includes health, education, transport, housing, and communications, and other sectors. This also is quite remarkable. On the deliberate targeting of, me of, of, of medical, of health facilities, medical personnel, and humanitarian workers, I want to I want to single out for attention some of the more recent work that has brought this forward in the international media. There was a recent letter uh, issued this week by Lancet of 50 prominent global public health uh, uh, leaders calling attention to this. There's the findings of the Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Syria. There's a recent op-ed by uh, Professor uh, Ron Waldman, who's with us today. All very, very powerful statements. We should anticipate that this crisis is likely to worsen before it gets better. And we have to admit the need for a high level, higher level contingency planning looking forward. As this war intensifies, driven by continued military attacks upon civilians by the Assad regime and the violent actions of an ever larger number of fragmented and divided armed opposition groups, the crisis will inexorably grow. Um, this crisis, and we'll hear more about this from our panelists, threatens the very stability of its neighbors, particularly Lebanon and Jordan, and we need to come to terms with what that means. Over two million Syrians are registered refugees or awaiting registration, and many suspect that many observers suspect the total number is much higher. Over 700,000 have fled uh, to Lebanon, over 500,000 to Jordan, over 450,000 to Turkey, over 160,000 in Iraq. In Lebanon, Syrian refugees officially now comprise a sixth of the nation's population. Unofficially, they exceed one million and account for one in five persons on the ground. Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey have all become increasingly vocal that this rapid, massive, unsustainable refugee influx stresses their economies, support systems, and infrastructure to the breaking point. For the long term, and we'll hear more about this from our experts, this crisis is fundamentally altering the region. Uh, we have to ask what the long-term changes are going to look like and what that means in terms of investments in development beyond the immediate emergency. We've talked about the need for effective contingency planning particularly if some of the estimates, like an estimate of 3.5 million refugees uh, outside of Syria in the near term, from up, to, up from 2 million, uh, high-level contingency planning will be essential if, if these scenarios are reached. The second is the sustainability of commitment. 
How do we leverage commitments from other wealthy countries who have not been at the table? How do we get Russia, China, Saudi Arabia to, make, to become a party to supporting this effort over the long term? And how do we navigate here in the U.S. our own budget woes? Access, protection, and humanitarian capacity remain central, as we said, to this. How do we redouble international pressure and attention to improve respect for international humanitarian norms, expand cross-border access, and strengthen the coordination? And how are we going to restabilize this, re this, this region, including blending development investments with emergency responses and planning over a period of the next seven to ten years for this? And of course, the macro question, which we'll hear more from our participants, is how do we place this crisis at the center of strategic thinking about the future of Syria and the region? And how do we begin to tie and exploit whatever diplomatic breakthroughs happen, if they do happen, centered upon the Geneva Framework Agreement? So please join me in, in welcoming our guests here today. Uh, you have their bios. Um, Zahir Salul is president of the Assyrian American Medical Society. Uh, he's uh, been um, indefatigable in, the, in, in building up that organization into a very important voice within the United States, but also an operational presence within the region and within Syria. We're joined by Rob Jen Jenkins, director of the Office of Transition Initiatives at USAID and executive director of USAID's Syria Task Force, just back from the Stockholm meetings yesterday of the uh, emergency directors and UN agency representatives focused upon Syria. They had met two months back in Brussels, were reconvened yesterday in, um, in Stockholm to deliberate on some of these key items that we've just mentioned. Sophie uh, Dolonay, the executive director of Médecins Sans Frontières in the U.S., has come, kindly come from New York to join us today. As we all know, MSF has been a terribly important voice throughout this crisis. And my colleague, John Alterman, the Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy and Director of the Middle East Program at CSIS. Um, John, if you could kick things off by talking a bit about your outlook on the, uh, the significance and how you see the region and how you see your newest national interests, and then we could move um, uh, uh, to our other folks, starting with Zahir. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much for coming. Um, I know from the RSVP list that all of you do tremendous work, so thank you for what you do. I think what, what I'm going to try to do is to link what I do and what you do, because I think th there has not been enough of a link. Um, if Syria were a contained crisis, we would think of it the way we think of the killing in the DRC. We think of it the way we think of the killing in Darfur. It's something to do, but it is something that doesn't often rise to the level of national strategic thinking. The reality is that what is happening in Syria needs to rise to the level of national strategic thinking because it is terribly important. The Syrian countryside isn't the Sudanese countryside. It's not the Congolese countryside. The problems of Syria are spilling over to a whole host of key U.S. allies, and they directly threaten U.S. strategic interests. What I think is a little bit strange from the U.S. side is there hasn't been more explicit discussion of what strategic interests are in Syria, because I think people are afraid that if we acknowledge that we should care, then we should have to do a lot, something we might not want to do. But not talking about it doesn't make our interests go away. And what I'm going to try to do is to help you have the information, the ammunition, to argue that we really have to care and do something about this. The underlying reality is this. The United States remains deeply tied to the Middle East, and the Middle East is threatening to slip its moorings. There is no more likely cause for that prospect today than what's happening in Syria today. We are used to not thinking very much about Syria because Syria, quite frankly, has made itself into a pain in the butt for years and years and years. And totally preoccupied with their weakness, they've decided that what they will do is they will obstruct. And if you want anything from the Syrians, you have to give something to the Syrians. And so we have been used to not dealing very much with them. Because every time, you, you, there was not a cooperative relationship. Whenever we wanted something, they said, well, what will you give us? And if we really needed it, we'd give it. And otherwise, we'd find a workaround. So we built very strong relations with all of Syria's neighbors. Now, those neighbors are under threat precisely because 
the problems of Syria are going across the border. There are more than 2 million Syrians who have fled Syria for surrounding countries, as Steve mentioned. These refugees, many of them desperately poor, have put tremendous stress on U.S. allies. Jordan, ordinarily, under the best of circumstances, Jordan strains to provide water, electricity, and adequate employment for a population of 6 million people. They now have more than a half million refugees, almost one in 10 Jordanians, or one in 10 of the population of Jordan is a refugee. Lebanon has only 4.4 million people and somewhere between three quarters of a million and a million refugees. These governments have a terrible time providing jobs and schools and protecting vulnerable populations in the best of times. And these are not the best of times. Many families are taking people in. The, the problem is when does this end, right? If you told me just another month and then we're gonna resolve it, that's one thing. But people are being displaced from jobs, housing prices are going up, food prices are going up, and there is no end in sight for these countries which are strained to their capacity. The problems, I think, go well beyond the strains on infrastructure that we're used to thinking about. Gee, Jordan doesn't have enough water. What are we going to do about Jordanian water? That's not the problem. The real problem is that these problems are going to endure for years after there is the beginning of a political settlement. It may be that a million or more Syrians will never return to their homes. While it's premature to suggest that these refugees are going to tip these countries into political and economic crisis, it's not an exaggeration to say that they make very precarious situations in these countries even more so. The collapse of any of these states would have a profound effect around the region. Jordan in particular is a bulwark of stability for Israel. It would surely make Iraq less, even less stable than it is today. So that's one, is you have fragile states, close allies of the United States, tremendously threatened by these large refugee populations which are not going anywhere. The second piece is the radicalization piece. These radical networks that are feeding into the Syrian war and growing through the Syrian war. Estimates are there are more than 1,000 Western jihadis currently fighting in Syria. That's more than 1,000 people from Europe, the United States, other Western countries currently fighting in Syria. Hundreds of Algerians and Tunisians have died fighting in Syria. There are so many jihadis going into Syria that Syria is actually exporting jihadis into Iraq to go kill Shia because they have more fighters than they need. Like the Afghan war in the 1980s, Syria provides an opportunity for fighters to train, radicalize, and network, and like that war, the echoes of the Syrian conflict are likely to reverberate long after the guns in Syria fall silent. This radicalization problem, both among foreign fighters and often also among refugee populations, is a problem for larger countries such as Turkey, a NATO ally of the United States, and also for Iraq. It may also provide a base for further strikes against Israel. I would argue that both the instability of surrounding states problem and the radicalization problems threaten spilling over into close U.S. allies in the Gulf, which are, of course, vital to global energy supply. While the Gulf, Gulf countries themselves feel justified supporting proxies in Syria so as to wage a long-distance war with Iran, they would be the first to shake if a pro-Western government fell in the Levant, and especially if a monarchy succumbed to popular displeasure. Similarly, as Syria learned from its own experience facilitating jihad in the 2000s, and as Saudi Arabia learned after 2001, radical networks operate in many directions. Efforts to export violence at one point often turn into processes that import violence at another. None of this is intended to downplay the scourge of chemical weapons whose earlier use in Iraq in the 1980s and in Yemen in the 1960s didn't draw the United States into war. I'm also not arguing for US military intervention in Syria but what I do think is that we need a much more vigorous effort to resolve the conflict in the country, which probably requires a fair dose of diplomacy and intelligence and military support. Russia has been Syria's patron, but Russia is not blind to its own interests. And we share a narrow set of interests with Russia, which fears that radical networks are going to spread from Levant to the Caucasus. The fear that those networks will obtain chemical weapons surely played a large role motivating Russian diplomacy last week and will motivate Russian diplomacy for the years to come. It's a common interest 
it presents the United States with an opportunity to solve these fundamental problems facing the, United, facing the Middle East, and the United States should take that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting me again, Steve, and uh, congratulations for the moving to the new building. I'm looking forward for an event there about Syria, hopefully positive uh, outlook on Syria. Um, and uh, while I'm coming here, and sorry, I don't have written uh, remarks as uh, Steve and uh, John. Um, I had a kidney stone last week, so I didn't have time to prepare. But uh, we don't uh, really have day jobs, you know. We work in a think tank. <laughs> I have day jobs. I'm a critical care specialist uh, in Chicago, and I think one of the positive um, um, effects of the last three weeks' attention on Syria that the American public in general right now are paying attention to Syria. Uh, every uh, news out outlet or media outlet in Chicago have interviewed Syrian Americans. Mm -hmm. So for the first time, it looks like uh, Americans discovered that we have Syrian Americans among ourselves and their opinion about Syria is important. So some of my patients were coming to me and, see we, and they're saying, oh, we saw you on TV and we like what you're doing on Syria. Uh, Syrian American Medical Society is one of the uh, NGOs that have been helping over the past two and a half years in delivering medical relief to Syria across the border uh, from Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. Uh, so we have a network of um, doctors, medical personnel, and activists in, in Jordan, in Turkey, inside Syria, of course, and in Lebanon, who are helping uh, providing much-needed uh, and life-saving medical assistance to uh, Syrian doctors and hospitals. Um, also, one of the observations that uh, I was reflecting on that this is the first time that a large sector of the Syrian society look at the United States <coughs> positively. And um, the last time that uh, many Syrians look at the United States positively was um, 1920, uh, when we have uh, a commission called the Crane King Commission, uh, Crane from Chicago, so that's um, my connection to him. Is a businessman. At that time, the uh, American government sent this commission uh, to um, take uh, and the opinion of the Syrian uh, population after the, um, uh, the end of the Ottoman Empire at that time. And there was, a, at that time, a treaty being contemplated to divide the Middle East between England and France. And the commission, Crane, uh, United States was considered a neutral country in the Middle East. So we sent this commission, and uh, actually their conclusion was very positive, and they recommended to our government at that time to take uh, seriously the, the aspiration of the Syrian people and the statehood. Um, since then, I don't think that there was much positive encounter between the Syrian politics and the, uh, uh, and the American, uh, and the American pop politics and the Syrian public. Uh, but right now, many Syrians look at the United States as the country that can try to end the conflict in their country. And um, they look positively at the humanitarian assistance that we are providing. We are proud as Syrian American that uh, our nation is the large single donor in terms of humanitarian assistance to the Syrian refugees and Syrians inside Syria. Uh, Turkey probably um, uh, spent more money on refugees uh, according to the estimates. Uh, $1.5 billion was spent by the Turkish government on Syrian refugees. We spent more than about $1 billion in humanitarian assistance um, uh, in general. Uh, the other trends that have been happening, um, and I'm sure that some of you or most of you are right now familiar with these scenes, very painful scenes of the children struggling to breathe and convulging before dying, uh, and that happened on August 21st. And by the, by, the, by the way, this is not the first time that chemical weapon uh, has been used in Syria. The first time I've seen similar scene was in December 23rd in 2012, uh, and that was a small-scale chemical weapon attack in the city of Homs, my city, um, and uh, not many children at that time died. Uh, there were about 10 or 15 adults who died, and we reported this um, chemical weapon attack to, um, to the State Department. We shared with them the medical findings of the doctors over there, and since then there were at least 24 chemical weapon attack that is documented in Syria. And then, of course, the largest one in August 21st in Al Ghouta, East Al Ghouta and West Al Ghouta. I was speaking with some of the doctors uh, that were treating patients in East Al Ghouta in a small city called Hamouria. And Al Ghouta, uh, by the way, is a large area, uh, very congested in population. Uh, it's around Damascus. 
Uh, it has 1.5 million people, and it has many cities that are medium in size and large in size. One of the cities, for example, Duma, has 500,000 people. So it's not like a rural area. And uh, this is the area where the chemical weapon uh, fell. So this doctor from the city of Hamouria told me that his city has 10 beds. Uh, he received 750 patients that night, 750 patients. Out of them, 95 died. Out of those 95 who died, 40 were children. And he was crying when he told me that the, for the first time in his life that he has to choose which patient he has to save or he can save. So he, of course, chose children. Um, you know, a couple of months ago, we had our international conference in Amman, in Jordan, talking about what do you do when you have limited resources uh, and, um, and in a medical disaster like what's happening in Syria, because the doctors in Syria are dealing with that on a daily basis. We deal with that in the United States, but a different scale. For example, in the intensive care unit where I practice, sometimes they told us that we have limited supply of this um, uh, anesthesia medicine or pain medicine, so use something different. That's the extent of the limited resources we have, luckily, in this country. But over there, they don't have blood products. They don't have uh, gauze. Sometimes they don't have CT scans, for example. The city of Aleppo, which has a population of 2 million people, one of the largest city in Syria, or the second largest city, has no functioning CT scanner. So this limited resources has been a struggle, and uh, SAMS and uh, Medicine Without uh, Borders and other NGOs have been struggling to provide resources to the doctors so they can do their humanitarian work. Also, what we've noticed that uh, healthcare have been used as a tool to exploit the population and as a weapon. Uh, just a couple of days ago, the United Nations Commission of Inquiry has reported um, the, uh, their findings about targeting medical personnel and medical facilities in Syria. And this is, by the way, um, a confirmation of our report that we published about four months ago about the same thing, our report called Saving Life, uh, um, uh, Sacrificing, Sacrificing, uh, Sacrificing, um, Michelle? Risking. Risking lives to save lives, uh, the ordeals of the Syrian medical personnel. And the United Nations Commission of Inquiry uh, has published this uh, findings a couple of days ago that uh, reaffirmed the same thing, that there is a systematic abuse of the medical uh, situation in Syria by the Syrian government and, and some of the also opposition fighters in order to um, prevent the other side from, uh, from having health care. Some of the extremist uh, also uh, groups have been exploiting the healthcare situation by providing free healthcare and free clinics to the population in the area so they can win the heart and the mind. Of course, uh, we can talk about the um, uh, refugee situation. This is the worst exodus of populations since Afghanistan. So we're not talking about a million or two million, we're talking about one third of the population who are right now displaced from their neighborhoods and from their cities. The equivalent of 120 million Americans being displaced. This is biblical proportions. And sometimes these numbers, we don't take it in, into perspective, but imagine that every person who is displaced, whether they're refugees or internally displaced, they have a painful story. They were displaced because they witnessed violence, because some of their family members have been killed or injured, because their neighborhood have been bombed. Some of the recent refugees, for example, to Iraq, from uh, the northeast Syria. Most of them, um, uh, when uh, the Iraqi uh, Kurdistan opened the border, um, uh, went to Iraq because of economic uh, reasons, not because of fear from violence. So the, the recent trend that the many of the refugees who are going to Iraq, at least, are going because there's loss of economic means and their inability to sustain food uh, and, uh, uh, and health care to their children and families. The most depressing, uh, of course, um, a trend is that there is no end in sight. Um, I was a little bit hopeful a few months ago when we had this um, uh, panel discussion about Syria, but right now, even after this uh, disarmament uh, agreement about chemical we weapon uh, deal between the United States and Russia, it doesn't look like the humanitarian crisis will end soon. Uh, many of the Syrians I've been talking w uh, with, including my family, are very depressed because they told us that we were hoping, we were hoping that there will be an end or acceleration of the end uh, because of the uh, United States um, intervention, but right now it doesn't look like there is an end in sight. 
So with that, maybe I can end my remarks, and then we can uh, pick it up later on. Thank you. Rob, would you care to Thanks, Steve and uh, John, for, for the invite. Um, thank you, Sahir, for putting a, a face a bit on, on, the, on the numbers. And thank you to you and you, Sophie, for the great work that both your organizations are doing. Um, the statistics do get very daunting very quickly, and it's important to remember that that is just a, a, a mathematic way of looking at a, a human tragedy. Every one of those refugees, every one of those IDPs is someone's brother or sister, mother or father, uh, someone's child. And as mentioned, uh, with President Obama's announcement on the occasion of Eid of another $195 million, the U.S. government is the largest donor, um, over a billion dollars now. Um, that includes refugees and uh, assistance to those inside. U.S. government funding, thanks to the American taxpayer, is now helping uh, 3.5 million people inside Syria, reaching into all 14 of the governance there. Um, we have 26 different partners, and we continue to do whatever we can to get assistance inside Syria by whatever methods, means, and channels that we can. Uh, our priorities are emergency medical care, food, and much-needed relief supplies. Uh, some of the uh, medical points and medical facilities that were involved with the response on April 21st were funded by the U.S. government. We're currently supporting 260 different medical facilities uh, around Syria. But you have to remember, and Zahir could help you with this, uh, get a picture of this. Some of these are just a room in someone's apartment that might have to move immediately from one location to another um, as it becomes shelled. And as Steve said, I just got, I just got off a plane from Stockholm with uh, the, the emergency directors of United Nations agencies met together with others from international organizations, NGOs, and the major donors of the world. And uh, they come together about every two months to try to see what is the situation, what can we do, and what do we need to talk about and, and look forward. Uh, I wish we could have said, yes, we see an end in sight. Um, it was all about contingency planning, not about planning for an end in sight, unfortunately. The first thing we did was, we, was just to grapple with the enormity of the crisis, to look at what we know, what we don't know right now. The situation in Syria is not a Syrian humanitarian response situation, as others have alluded to. It is now a regional crisis that's not just an emergency crisis. It is a regional crisis that is not going away anytime soon. UNDP's estimate is that if, miraculously, right now, all the fighting were to stop and people could go home, it would take eight to 12 years to repatriate and resettle those people that are currently refugees and IDPs. That's if, miraculously, everything stopped and was okay right now. We all know that's not going to be the case. So the timeline is already 8 to 12 years out, and that's just on one sector. So it was interesting that UNDP attended this along with the World Bank, because we're looking at this now as the term is a comprehensive approach is what's needed. The humanitarian infrastructure, the relief infrastructure of the world, is breaking under the strain of, of this crisis. And all of the things that we're doing inside, but especially outside, especially in Lebanon and Jordan, needs to be seen not in six-month increments, but what can be done now by the world's donors and by those two nations to help uh, prevent the breaking apart of those societies that we're looking at. So it can't just be refugee camps. It has to be water systems. It has to be working with municipalities. It has to be long-term solutions. In this business, we talk a lot about host communities. And the term is now coming up that it's not host communities, it's host nations. Lebanon's a very small country. 1,400 different locations that have measurable numbers of refugees in a very small place that you can drive around in a day. Um, to use... Uh, another analogy, it's as though 50 million refugees in one year came into this country. The strain that that's putting under that country is enormous. So we talked about as donors, as the world community trying to help, 
Um, what can we do to try to put into practice all the theories we've been talking about for years about working together and the relief to development continuum and the resiliency agenda? What does that actually mean now? It's no longer an academic exercise. We have to do this in real time right now working together. The World Bank just finished. Um, they phoned in to the meeting yesterday because they were about to present the Prime Minister of Lebanon the findings from their rapid assessment. They worked at an unprecedented rate for the World Bank. When asked, I think about six weeks ago or less, by the Prime Minister um, to carry out an assessment on the repercussions of this inflow on the economic and societal, uh, uh, what are the repercussions on the economy and the society, um, they pulled the team together within a week and a half and they completed the study um, and we're all going to eagerly weed, read it in the next few days. We're afraid there's going to be some very, very large numbers in that about what needs to happen uh, monetarily. So we looked at that and obviously a massive crisis requires massive funding. As Steve said, the UN appeal is $4.4 .4 billion, the largest appeal in UN history. I think it makes up more than half of what the UN's asking for for around the world, the whole world right now. And work has begun on the next appeal. These are six month increments. That one came up in June. So in two months, we're gonna have another figure for all of us to look at and as military colleagues say, admire the problem. Um, it's, so how do we do this? How do we, where, where, where is this money gonna come from? Because the end isn't in sight. I wish I could report that we came up with some brilliant ideas. Two months ago in Brussels, we had the same brainstorming session. Um, how do we pull in the Gulf? Pulling in the World Bank is a step, but someone has to fund the World Bank, right? Loans aren't gonna satisfy this problem right now for the, for the neighboring countries. How do we pull in the IMF? How do we pull in the non-traditional donors? We're all very thankful that Kuwait gave $300 million, which is, um, uh, a very large amount for a Gulf state to give through multilateral channels. Um, they did that on the occasion last January of them hosting the donor conference. Ideas came up of who, where do we want the next donor conference to be, if that's maybe going to um, uh, have someone write a check. But we really struggled and looked. Do we reach out to the, to the Brazilians, to the, to the BRICS? Um, people talked about, can we use um, private sector solutions into, in the housing uh, uh, sector? Um, I'm a little bit skeptical in an emergency situation when you, when you say you want to turn to the private sector. I'm not sure how you're going to get the private sector to respond to build homes that no one's going to pay for for a very long time. But, but let's give it a try. Let's see what we can do. And then we talked about access. And it's hard for me to find people that want to have dinner with me anymore because I don't shut up about access. In Syria right now, as dire as the money situation is, it's not money. It's access linked to security. How do you get what needs to be gotten to the people that need it right now? There are a lot of people. Sahar is one of them and he works with many of them who are extremely heroic, who are risking their lives, and many are losing their lives, trying to get things to where it needs to be. The ICRC, uh, International Committee of the Red Cross, they, were, they had for six months been trying to negotiate access into Al Huta, sorry for the pronunciation, before April 21st. They had not been able, no one had been able to get the relief that we needed to get in there for six months. And after the events of April 21st, they still have not gotten inside. And ICRC complains that it's getting increasingly more difficult to get to hot spots or where there's currently fight, uh, fighting because the Syrian government is actively preventing them from getting there. So we talked about that and then we ended with discussion on risk. As donors, as implementers, as the United Nations, how much risk are we really willing to take in all of its forms? That's financial risk, if things get stolen in these bad places. That's how many people are going to be killed 
trying to deliver the assistance? How do we make the decisions on when do we not go someplace, knowing that people need to get the assistance, but it's too dangerous to get there? There's no simple answers to that. There's no, there's no slide rule that shows you the, 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 the number. But as I've uh, spent some time now trying to educate colleagues in the United States government on, um, I got a question not too long ago, but surely USAID, they don't, your partners don't deliver the assistance where the war is, right? They're sort of over on the side where it's safe. And I had to say, this is not East Africa. This is not a, this is not a camp in East Africa where you drive a truck up and you offload the, this is people risking their lives going through lines several times a day being shot at, taking mortars um, to deliver assistance. It is a scary situation without, without a clear end in sight. And we ended the meeting noting that 10,000 people were dead since we met eight weeks prior. And then someone said, not dead, killed. A little bit different. We're going to meet again in, in uh, eight weeks. And it was for all of us to, to leave with the thought of how many, how many more people will be killed and what can all of us do as donors, as implementers, as NGOs, what can we do to try to limit that number in the next eight weeks and then plan for God knows how long after that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rob. Sophie, thank you for being so patient. Uh, and uh, I'd like to ask you to share your thoughts on the MSF outlook on this and your work, which has been so okay. important in this period. Thanks, Stephen, and thanks for inviting me. Well, the, the good thing is that I don't have to repeat uh, everything that has been said. I, uh, I very much echo most of the, the comments, uh, especially from Zahir and Rob, on the, on the situation as we see it uh, on the ground in Syria. So clearly, uh, when I was preparing for this panel, I was thinking, OK, what could could we describe today as the main challenges? Uh, clearly, the the, uh, the scale of the crisis and I its regional nature uh, in in itself is a, is a challenge. The fact that it's been going on for two years, and that it's going to last for long is quite uh, unprecedented. In for an organization like MSF, the estimated budget for this year only in Syria is about sixty million dollar, which is equivalent to uh, our largest project in South Sudan and DRC. And it's only $60 million because of the access problems that we, you mentioned, because of, the, uh, uh, of the, the, the difficulty to mobilize also uh, finances. Otherwise, uh, we, we would do much more in Syria and outside Syria. Uh, and even though we would still be a drop in an ocean of needs, that, that's for sure. Um, so uh, regarding the, we, we have to be careful when describing this crisis from a humanitarian standpoint, because the humanitarian consequences are not so different from any humanitarian crisis that we see from a medical and uh, sanitary standpoint. So for the refugees, the needs are, are very clear and easy to identify. Those needs are needs for clean water, for shelter, for distribution of food, uh, for provision of healthcare. And uh, inside Syria, we started our response like we do in many other conflicts. That is, you start providing uh, medical care for uh, war wounded, and our programs were mostly focused on surgery, and gradually we had to evolve toward immunization, a treatment of chronic disease, uh, which is a clear sign of the deterioration of the health system. Uh, so although this is... Uh, um, this is a challenge, responding to all these needs at the same time. It's still not so different in their nature from any other humanitarian uh, crisis we've responded to. What is uh, unprecedented, however, is uh, what you uh, very eloquently uh, described. Uh, it's uh, certainly inside, it's the, uh, uh, the level of violence that we are witnessing and the obstacles to, uh, to aid inside Syria. 
Uh, you talked about access. Yes, clearly access is an issue. Getting access, getting authorization to work in a country. Although we're called Doctors Without Borders, it's very rare in our history that we uh, cross borders illegally. We always ask for uh, an authorization. But in the case of, of Syria, uh, and I think it's the first time since uh, our early years in Afghanistan when we were crossing the border from Pakistan that we have actually made the decision as an institution to cross the border uh, without the consent of Damascus. Because after two years of uh, attempts to negotiate and to gain access, we were still not uh, authorized to do so. So access is definitely uh, an issue. And the level of violence, the, the systematic targeting of health facility that has started at the very, very beginning of this crisis, after the first demonstration, actually, there was a deliberate targeted of medical staff and uh, health providers and health facility. This has just uh, uh, expanded uh, throughout the conflict, and uh, it makes our operation it, it puts the life of our uh, 450 staff inside Syria uh, at risk, definitely, and uh, it makes the work very difficult. It does limit our ability to operate, to move. Uh, when you start your operations providing surgery, uh, it's okay to stay in the building all day long. Your anesthesiologist is here, your, surg your, su your surgeon, and the rest of the medical staff. But when, when you realize that there is a measles outbreak and you have to vaccinate kids mm -hmm. and, uh, and do a very basic primary health care, when you realize that you need to do sanitation work in a camp where there are displaced coming in, then it becomes really challenging to deal with the, uh, the, the security issue. Uh, last week, one field hospital, again, uh, El Bab uh, in the north was uh, was hit, and uh, uh, nine patients were killed, as well as two uh, two medical staff. And this violence is not only uh, the the fact of uh, the government bombing health facilities, as you also mentioned, Zahir. Uh, there are some elements in the opposition who have also adopted some uh, criminal practices. There is no. Uh, other words than, than this, against the population, against journalists, against aid workers, uh, and uh, through assassination, through threats and, uh, and killings. Uh, we lost one surgeon last week who was uh, himself uh, killed. Um, so all these are critical blockages for aid, and they also add to the numerous uh, checkpoints and harassment that the population is subject to. When you talk to a refugee crossing the border into Iraq or Jordan or Lebanon, they all tell you that they had to go through numerous checkpoints, investigation, interviews, and on the way they've also exhausted all their financial resources. So when they arrive in the neighboring country, they don't even have enough money to pay for, for rent or to wait until the registration by UNHCR is done. So it's a huge challenge uh, inside Syria in terms of uh, of access. Outside, clearly the situation of refugees, I, I won't repeat, I think that uh, we are all aware of uh, um, the, 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 the scale of, uh, of this crisis. Um, for me, what's interesting is that six months ago we were extremely worried about the situation in Jordan. There's been, a, I think it's important when we talk about this type of tragedy to also recognize when there are some, some progress that has been made and to advocate for maintaining this effort. And what we see clearly uh, is that in Jordan, uh, uh, and particularly in Zatari camp, that was a camp where we had great concerns about the risk of outbreak and uh, the lack of uh, international community involvement. It seems uh, from a report I got last week that the situation is, is under control. Uh, the, the, the refugees in the camp get 35 liters of water per day, per person, which is completely in the standards, and uh, even some Jordan, Jordanian uh, uh, claims that they don't have as much water for, for their own needs. So um, we haven't noticed any outbreak in recent weeks. Uh, there, there is definitely a mobilization there. Outside of the camps is another issue. A lot of people are still waiting uh, to be registered. And the, if you're not registered, you don't have access to the minimum um, 
support and uh, relief items that you could be entitled to, to get. And it's also becoming very clear that the Jordanian system, uh, health system, which claims to provide health care to 95% of their population, is completely stretched now with the, uh, uh, the um, influx of... Um, of, uh, of refugees from Syria. So this is certainly, uh, although Jordan seems to be under control at the moment, there is really a need to uh, maintain and ramp up our efforts, particularly uh, for refugees who, who are out of reach because they are not necessarily inside the, the camps. Uh, Lebanon for us is uh, the major concern, that's for sure. Uh, we, um, we've tried to focus on, on, on health care, but the provision of care is extremely challenging due to the fact that the population is spread throughout the country, that uh, the Lebanese government, for very good reason, and does not wish to, uh, does not allow any uh, formal settlement of refugees. But the result is that <coughs> there is a complete disorganization of the aid in Lebanon at the moment. And certainly it's the main challenge is how can can we make it work better? How can we reach those people and ensure that there is a basic that the basic needs of this population are met at the moment? I will. I, I can um, elaborate a bit more uh, after, but uh, for the moment, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of our speakers this afternoon. Why don't we turn momentarily for one issue here about the po prospects for for positive change, prospects for diplomatic opening. I mean, the, the, you know, one of the mysteries and frustrations of the Syrian case as this crisis has burgeoned in the last 20 months, one of the frustrations, I think, of, of all of the people here has been this, the desensitization, as I think Haim had, had, had labeled it, the fact that the war weariness within America and the, the magnitude of this crisis was not moving people to see it in, in, for the full, in the full magnitude uh, of, of what it is. Uh, this was a creeping catastrophe. It hadn't really begun to register in the consciousness of Americans in a way we might expect and in other, and in other key capitals and uh, uh, within the region and, and, and within Europe and elsewhere. Uh, what I hear you saying uh, in various forms is that there's some change happening. That so I hear you talked about how the media in Chicago was beginning to 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 to, to pay attention. The threat of war, the threat of the U.S. returning to war, was the dominant concern that seemed to crowd out much other consider many other considerations, at least for the moment with the Geneva framework. On the, with the U.S.-Russia-Geneva framework, the threat of an, an immediate turn to war has, has been withdrawn, and people are perhaps able now to, to begin to engage and think more, uh, uh, more seriously about what this means. Rob, you mentioned about the World Bank and the fact that the World Bank has jumped in on a crash basis to begin addressing these dysfunctions and threats that we've heard about in Lebanon. And John, you're talking about how this does really touch U.S. national interest, and a new debate has to begin. And you, you're at the front of pushing that debate, but maybe the maybe the circumstances are ones that now allow us to think and about all of this in a in a in a more uh, credible way. And uh, Sophie, you you've told us that some there are some solutions in places like Jordan. My question to you all would be if 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 in fact. This ambitious and very uncertain Geneva framework agreement, if it's possible for this to move forward on its extraordinarily ambitious short time frame, even if it moves forward faultingly uh, and, 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 and with enormous problems encountered politically and operationally and the like, does this create an opening, do you think? Um, does this create an opening to leverage higher access and protection on humanitarian uh, operations? Does it pro create an opening, potentially, to get, uh, to put the humanitarian, the human crisis, into the picture strategically around what the solution? Does it allow the ability to get the Chinas and the Saudis and the Russians to make serious financial material commitments towards resolving this crisis? 
Those have been the missing building blocks in this entire thing. John, could if, you if, start? Yeah, if I could just sort of take your, your, your silver lining and, and describe the dark cloud around it. I think that <laughs> the real danger of the Geneva deal is this, that the entire focus shifts from the heart-rending issues that you've heard every member on this panel describe from what Rob eloquently talked about as the eight to 12 year problem, if you resolve all the political issues and you stop working the political, because you are so vested in working on the chemical weapons track, because you are looking at a small piece of the problem, you need the cooperation. For those of you who worked in the US government, you know that when there's a negotiation ongoing, everybody works to create an environment conducive to successful negotiation, and the political track gets neglected, and what you have, in fact, is an entrenchment of the refugee problem, an entrenchment of the, the problems affecting the surrounding states, an entrenchment of the radicalization, and you put off dealing with the political issues instead of facilitating. It doesn't have to be that way, but I think there's an incentive to do it that way. And I think what, what's incumbent on us is to keep in mind that the real prize is finding a way to deal with the political issues, that the chemical issues are a way, they need to be an entree to the political issues, but they can't be a substitute for the political issues. Let me also just comment on something that, that uh, Sophie said about the Zatri camp. You know, the Jordanian border's essentially been shut, and I was at Zatri just at the time, just before it got shut, and they were getting 3,000 people a day. It was totally out of control. That border seems to have been closed in cooperation between the Free Syrian Army and Jordanian authorities. There are a lot more people who can't get out of Syria who are trapped at that border. Even within Jordan, two-thirds of Syrian refugees in Jordan are outside of camps. And they are taxing all of the infrastructure, education, jobs, housing. I mean, you can't rent the hovel in some of these northern cities without paying hundreds of dollars a month, there is tremendous desperation. I, it's easy, to, I think, to, to look at the camps and to feel the camps are getting organized, and the guys at Zatri are doing absolutely spectacular work. I'm tremendously impressed by the people I met, but they understand that they are working in a vicious context. They're a small piece of the issue and there's a broader context which ultimately the only solution to the problems are political solutions. And we can do the, 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 the humanitarian issues and we can do access and everything else, very important to do, but we can't take our eye off the fact that unless we can find a political resolution to this, the problems are going to persist, not for a year, not for two years, but as I said, as Rob eloquently said, eight to 12 or more. I mean, this is a similar human displacement to the Palestinian refugee crisis of 1948, which some of you may have heard about. That's the scale. That's the scale. And there are still many, many Palestinian refugees inside Syria who are now caught up with all this. Um, I won't speak to the larger prospects other than as a government, we have been and will remain be committed to a political solution and there is no other way to end this thing. No amount of humanitarian assistance is going to, to solve the, the problem of Syria. But if I could look for a silver lining, try to steal it back just a little bit, um, with other donors in the UN agencies, we talked about the fact that there's been attempts at negotiations going on for a very long time on a small scale in different places to try to get humanitarian access. Sometimes it works, usually it doesn't. But as uh, one colleague said, uh, where there's a will, there's a way. And uh, uh, the UN inspectors that got the access to go in to look at uh, what happened on August 21st in fact, that was an opening of such. There was enough attention on that issue from all sides that they actually were able to negotiate what they haven't been able to negotiate on humanitarian uh, means. So that's a precedent. If, in fact, there's going to be negotiations about further inspections with the New Deal, 
that could become an opening that if there's a regime that's put in place that has regular inspections and regular teams going out to different locations, it's not too much, I think, to then step back once and say, can we use the same sort of negotiations, whatever they put in place for that, to also get humanitarian access into places. Um, it might work. It's not going to solve the problem, but it's an opening, perhaps. I would think it would be awfully uncomfortable if you have chemical weapons inspectors negotiating access into sensitive areas where there's acute and raging humanitarian need if the humanitarian access and protection issues are not treated in some fashion. It's just going to, it's going to create enormous dissonance uh, for that to be the case um, looking forward. Um, perhaps uh, Zahir and Sophie, could, as, as operational folks. Sophie, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I'd like to, uh, to react and respond partly to your question, because of course it's not uh, for a uh, non-governmental organization like MSF to uh, comment on what is the right political solution. But we are certainly well placed to describe and comment on the humanitarian consequences of these political decisions. And what happened at the moment in Syria is that actually we are facing the humanitarian consequences of a lot of political decision and lack thereof. So the, for us, it's, it's clear at this moment, even though we, we definitely welcome the shift from the discussion being purely focused on chemical weapon to a more broader diplomatic effort, but it's, it's also extremely important that humanitarian considerations be fully part of this diplomatic effort and that the uh, uh, demanding for those, because as you said, uh, we have a window of opportunity right, at the moment. There is a, a, a real opportunity for discussion, for making political advances. If we don't take this opportunity to address some critical humanitarian issues, we're going to lose the momentum. And there, are, uh, there is an opportunity to ask for stopping targeting health facilities. These are very basic and fundamentals of uh, the, 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 war, uh, uh, the war law. For facilitating access, there are plenty of instruments that exist in international humanitarian law to propose ideas, solutions that could be adapted to the Syrian context and to uh, mobilize more resources and not just resources and not just resources from the United States. We know the effort that has been made, but also trying to precisely take the opportunity and the advantage of the presence of other players around the table to have them contribute to this effort. And not just the financial resources, but the skills as well. Because we're facing a huge problem at the moment in terms of organization of aid. As I said, in Lebanon, uh, we need to do something about it. For many years, there is a UN agency, UNRWA, uh, which has a lot of experience in dealing with refugees. It's, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine that we don't find a better system to, uh, to coordinate aid. Um, a few things I would like to add to this, and I agree with all what you've said, uh, Sophie and, and Rob. Um, this is the first time in, in the history of Syria, recent history, that you have Palestinians uh, who are actually fleeing Syria to Gaza. I've never imagined in my life that you will have Palestinian going back to Gaza, but it's happening right now. Um, and that will give you the gravity of the situation. Some of them came from Al Yarmouk camp, which is in the middle of Damascus. But t today I was reading an interview with the head of the ICRC operation in Syria. And by the way, ICRC is doing a great job with the Syrian uh, Red Crescent also. Um, more than 20 members of the Syrian Red Crescent have been killed because of humanitarian work uh, and uh, because of the security situation. And she said, and this is corroborated, corroborated by doctors in, in Ghouta and Homs, that it's very difficult to get to areas in Syria, especially in the old city in Homs and Ghouta, for the past eight or nine months. Um, there were some, some reported children who died because of malnutrition in Al Muaddamiyah, which is in West Ghouta. Um, so to me, it's morally repulsive that we are talking about creating safe passage for uh, UN investigators to investigate chemical weapons that I'm sure that it will not be used again by the regime. I think that the regime is smart enough to learn the lessons. But we will not gonna allow safe passages for ICRC and uh, Sierra Nerd Crescent and other humanitarian organization to give food and medicine 
to Syrians. So I think we have a window of opportunity that the international community, United States, can use now that the Russians are suddenly are interested in peace. You know, I, I, I was uh, actually, I wanted to believe President Putin in his op-ed that he's, uh, you know, talking about the Pope praying for peace in Syria and so forth. So, I mean, I would like to believe that. So they're interested in pressuring the Syrian regime to disarm a uh, chemical weapon. Why not pressuring them now uh, to, um, to reach certain uh, humanitarian policies that will be helpful to NGOs and to Syrians, especially that the Syrian regime right now, it looks like they're open to compromise. Um, and this is, I think, a window that we may lose in the future, so we have to use it to the fullest. Um, so I hope that we can do that um, you know, uh, with the negotiation and have a Security Council resolution that will uh, enforce that. Uh, because without Security Council resolution, um, I, will ha I will have doubt that the Syrian regime will respect its word. Let's open the floor for comments and questions. Um, we have microphones um, in the back. We'll bring those to you. Uh, what I suggest we do is take uh, very brief comments and questions. And there's a one hand up. We'll bundle together uh, th three or four and then come back to our speakers. So if you could stand up, uh, just uh, identify yourself briefly, and then, sp and then uh, offer one quick uh, question or comment. Thank you. Nidal Garamo, I'm actually actually Iraqi. I did a lot of missionary trips in Iraq and Kurdistan mainly. I did not hear you saying anything. There's 200,000 refugees in Kurdistan that are well taken care of, and I have the head of the KRG in here from the representing office. Um, I went to Zaatari camp myself with NAMA organization, National Arab American Medical Association, and uh, the Kurdistan is not getting any help from any side. And I'm the ambassador also of health to Iraq, uh, to the World Medical Relief. So I sponsor a lot of medical containers to Iraq and Kurdistan mainly. But I am going to uh, go soon to Kurdistan to help the Syrian refugees. But we are desperate and help and it's safe there. There is no, no threat, no terrorist. They are doing a good job at doing that. So we're going to need help with doctors to continue this mission, supplies, and to help the Kurdistan government. We thank her also. The Kurdistan leaders are doing a great job in saving many lives. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There was a hand in the back, uh, just behind you there. Thank you. Um, my name is Christy Delafield. I'm the humanitarian aid liaison with the Syrian Opposition Coalition. I just wanted to get the panel's opinion on the idea of increasing the number of implementers. Um, there are quite a few Syrian organizations inside Syria that have access, but maybe um, the international community, INGOs, and other donors are very slow to authorize and fund those organizations because they don't have the long history. Um, Syria was not very open to the idea of uh, registering NGOs. Uh, what do you think the international community can do to increase these organizations' capacity um, to, to work with them so that we can have, you know, 10 more Dr. Zahers up here? Christy, you're talking with special reference to authorization to operate within Syria itself? Yeah. Okay. Do we have any other hands? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Rick Burzon. I'm with the National Institutes of Health. I do work in global uh, research. Uh, just a, a question about the lack of U.S. leadership here, and uh, if maybe, Bob, you could address this, and because I used to work for USAID, and it's a great place, but the influence that USAID may have on the State Department is um, mixed, and uh, uh, the fact of the matter is that things are bad, and they don't seem to be getting any better, and we can talk about what we'd like to happen. But I'm, I'm curious uh, if you could speak to what your perception is on whether or not, uh, given the domestic politics that face Obama right now, if there's likely to be any U.S. leadership uh, on these issues which are going from bad to worse and don't look like they're getting any better. Thank you. Do we have any other, uh, any other folks? We have a hand over in this corner here. Take this comment and question, then we'll come back uh, to... Uh, a question. I'm from, I'm Liang Xianqin from Shanghai Institute for International Studies. I'm here as a, a, a visiting fellow of C CSRS. My question is uh, actually about the political solution. 
uh, which is not uh, so closely connected to this topic, but I think that is very important. Uh, my question is that, and in Afghanistan, we find a person like uh, Karzai, uh, but uh, unfortunately, the, the situation in Afghanistan, Af Af Afghanistan is not very, uh, not a, uh, not a very optimistic. There are a lot of violences and the conflicts, but in Syria, we have many people are talking about uh, uh, intervention, but. The problem is that, have you ever find some people like Karzai? And, uh, and do you think that uh, uh, what is the prospect of uh, post-regime situation? Do you think that, do you think that uh, the things will be certainly much better than today? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take one more right here. And then we'll come back to uh, come back to our speakers. Hi, my name is Agron Ferrari. I'm with IPS. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, USAID and the international community as a humanitarian practitioner for all the aid that's going into Syria. Donors were really supporting our humanitarian agencies. Now, the, I have two questions about uh, absorptive capacity that humanitarian act actors have, including MSF and the access. These are two linked. Everybody wants money, but can they really spend money for the right purpose? And second is I call for urgent attention to support the uh, host countries such as Jordan and Lebanon. Are we prepared to accept the results of the studies that are saying that the Jordan healthcare system has 9% uh, of the Jordan healthcare system is being utilized by the Syrian refugees. And what are we are going to do about the numbers? So it's very easy to say the World Bank will come up with the study and percentages. Are we ready to accept that and deal with that? Thank you. Thanks. John, did you want to lead off at all with some of the bigger questions around what opposition and what would a political solution look like? And um, U.S. leadership blockages? I think the, the there are two issues. One is, is a U.S. issue of how much is the U.S. willing to invest in Syria. And I think, quite frankly, that has fluctuated uh, and will continue to fluctuate. Um, the President, I think, is increasingly focused on domestic agenda. And one of the things that I think is very important is to persuade people, you, and you persuade your friends and so on, that, that there actually are American interests at stake in Syria. We need to be engaged in them because I think that message, of all the messages that went out in the last two weeks, I think that message has not been said clearly enough. And I think that the way they talked about this, principally in terms of chemical weapons, I think uh, got us away from thinking about what is strategically important to ourselves and our allies. Um, you know, in terms of, of sort of a post-Assad Syria, um, I think leaderships are forged out of conflict, and there are people who manage to have supporters, and there are people who can't win supporters. And that's just, it, the, the only way to find out is not to have a bunch of seminars where you do interviews with people, it's to see what happens when you have a more open political process. Um, I hope that Syria will have that opportunity. I don't think the country has been well led at all for many years. Um, we have seen, I think, completely morally depraved leadership. You know, this issue of it's morally reprehensible to keep uh, health care providers out from these areas. There aren't a lot of people in the Syrian leadership who care at all about what's morally reprehensible. They're fighting a battle for survival against rebels, and they want the rebels to die and their supporters to die in as large numbers as quickly as possible as a strategic objective. And we can talk about what's morally reprehensible, but they think they're fighting a war and the moral stuff doesn't matter. What matters is winning. I think Syria needs a different leadership. What that leadership will look like, whether you'll have a Hamid Karzai, whether you'll have a George Washington, whether you'll have a Mao Zedong, I have no idea, but 
the only way to find out what happens is when you have a process that people attempt to lead and some will be successful and some will not. And certainly one of the, the very disturbing things about the Syrian opposition is how much it has tended to fight against itself rather than unifying to fight against the regime. That's not something the United States can fix, but it certainly has been an obstacle <clears throat> to efforts to have a different political future in Syria. Uh, thanks. Um, to our friend representing the KRG and to you, I, I had the great opportunity last week to meet with the foreign minister from the KRG who was visiting. Um, and we had very good conversations about and, and congratulated that government on the response to um, the influx of the 46 to, I guess, now 51,000 refugees that came across and what a great job uh, was done. Uh, our Office of Food for Peace immediately flew in by air 15 metric tons of high nutrition food uh, for that influx and uh, our State Department uh, PRM, Populations, Refugee and Migration Bureau, is actively working there with, with the government of the KRG but also the implementers there on, on, the, on the issue. Um, we had discussions about having more NGOs uh, be able to get money directly from, from donors and then also the possibility of letting uh, access to other uh, Syrian populations fr from there. And it, was, and it was a very good conversation. We're going to continue to, to look into that. Christy, your point about, um, well, first, I want to thank the, the SOC and the ACU, the um, uh, Assistance Coordination Unit based in Gaziantep, who's a very strong partner of USAID and the US government. We work with them very closely on coordination and um, have not just us, but the British and others have, have invested a lot of time, not just money, but I, even but money and, and personnel to try to build the capacity of the ACU. And if you look at what didn't, it didn't exist, I think, until January, December or January, it's made amazing strides and is a very, very good, solid partner. The issue about uh, donor money going directly to local Syrian organizations, um, many of you might have seen the letter that came out today signed by the many, many different doctors around the world about the situation. Um, there is a line there that's, that talks about the uh, international donor bureaucracy that gets in the way. Um, we do have our bureaucracies. And it is very difficult, not just in Syria, but anywhere in the world, for a brand new organization to get a direct grant directly from the US government. But there is not a single one of our partners active in Syria that doesn't partner with Syrian organizations themselves. Um, and capacity is being built by doing. It's a very, very busy time, and there's not a lot of, of programming looking at building the capacity of NGOs for that, say, for that purpose but capacity is being built. And every local NGO that comes and talks to me, I say, please seek out the other international partners that are there because they're actively looking to build their networks of more NGOs uh, locally. Uh, Rick, you worked for USAID, so I think you'll know what I will or will not say about um, uh, politics. I will say that Secretary Kerry, if you can look at, if, if, if the amount of time and energy he spends on an issue counts for leadership, he's exerting an extreme amount of leadership on this issue. He is seized with Syria, as is our president. The number of meetings at the highest levels of our government on these issues is, I've never seen anything like it. The sad truth is there's no easy answers. Um, and I, I somewhat enjoy, then get frustrated by lots of people debating why are we doing X or not doing Y, and then you always, well, what would you do? And they go, well, I don't know. I can't figure it out. Um, it's not for a lack of trying. It's not for a lack of attention. It's a very, very difficult issue, as John has, has pointed out. Um, yeah, thanks. A uh, couple of comments uh, in, uh, regarding the uh, question about uh, Kurdistan and uh, we'll be happy in Sam's to uh, help uh, if we're invited by the um, local government there and send our doctors uh, to help. Um, we just opened uh, recently an office in Lebanon and we'll be happy to expand and I'm sure that other organizations that are aware now with the recent influx of the Syrian refugees to Kurdistan will be also paying more attention to that. 
and we appreciate the effort that is done by the Iraqi government and the local Kurdistani government in Iraq for what they've done. I mean, they're doing great, and, uh, and uh, hopefully this will continue. Um, and I, I, I've never mentioned before, but I have to mention that we really appreciate the effort that is done by the Jordanian, the Lebanese, the Turkish government, the Iraqi government, the Egyptian government, all the government that are hosting the Syrian refugees. I know that this is not easy for them, especially with their limited resources, but we have to keep thanking them for what they are doing. This is not easy. By the way, the equivalent of uh, uh, Lebanon getting one million Syrian refugees is like we're getting 70 million Mexican refugees to the United mm -hmm. States. 70 million. Imagine how much uh, we will have stretched our means. Um, now, regarding the issue of the absorbing capaci uh, capacity and access, I would agree with you uh, that uh, uh, sometimes it's challenging. Um, uh, but what we've noticed that uh, there is a shifting priorities. So in the beginning, we were focusing on field hospitals because there are many areas that uh, the public hospitals, private hospitals were hit and destroyed and we started to support local physicians to build field hospitals and, and manning them with supplies and so forth. Uh, and these are, um, we, there will be a, com a report coming in uh, American Journal of Medicine about this phenomena, which I think it's unique to the Syrian uh, situation. Al-Bab hospital that was bombed, I visited a few months ago. Uh, it's located in one of the cultural center in the uh, city of Al-Bab to hide it from the Syrian regime. Uh, and this is the third field hospital that was hit in Al-Bab. The one before was uh, hidden in a uh, private villa of previous Syrian minister, was also hit and bombed. And the first one was in the uh, basement of a mosque, which was also completely destroyed. So this is really something that unimaginable, that you have field hospitals, um, makeshift hospitals, that uh, doctors are trying to save patients, and then it's to keep destroy uh, being destroyed and bombed. Um, I would like to mention the fact that uh, what kills Syrians now more than even shrapnels and bombs and bullets is chronic diseases, non-communicable diseases. And this is something which we all forget uh, because, first of all, uh, Syrians have lost the economic mean to buy medications. So many of them who have diabetes and heart disease are not able to buy medicine. And they prefer, of course, to have food than medicine, uh, including some of my family members who told me, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna stop taking the cholesterol medicine. Uh, I need food. Um, the second thing that uh, there is shortage of medications, uh, especially uh, insulin, chemotherapy for cancer patients. The third thing is the security situation that patients with cancer and chronic disease are not able to travel to have chemotherapy or radiation therapy or hemodialysis. And I'll give you one example in the city of Homs that had 49 dialysis unit before the crisis. Right now they have 12, and this is the third largest city in Syria. So many of patients who need hemodialysis, either that they will die or they will become refugees because they want to have hemodialysis. So the number, the estimated number of people who died because of non-communicable diseases, NCD, is about 200,000, more than the 120,000 uh, Syrians who were killed by bullets and shrapnels and bombing. And this is something that the NGOs and the international community should start paying attention to. Sophie. Regarding the, uh, the the support of the delegation to Syrian NGO, this is actually what, um, as an organization, and it's a very unusual modus operandi for for us. But this is what we started to do at the very beginning of the crisis. We supported Syrian networks, and then we were invited by these same networks to uh, run our own activity inside Syria because they were simply overwhelmed. In the meantime, we're still we're running six hospitals and four. Uh, smaller clinics inside Syria, but we're also, we also decided to continue supporting 27 other health facilities uh, through provision of drugs and, and a bit of financial support. And without this support, we would have uh, actually the facilities that were exposed to the uh, latest chemical attack would not have been able to respond to it because we had planned the provision, the supply of atropine. Uh, which is used to uh, 
uh, to treat patients exposed to neurotoxic agents. So this is, uh, I, I think we all have to recognize that uh, this is a very exceptional crisis and that uh, there is a need for uh, supporting whoever is in a better capacity to operate inside Syria. This being said, we're facing some dilemmas in trying to uh, expand the support. Of course, accountability is one severe dilemma for NGOs which are relying on the generosity of donors and uh, who have to um, be accountable for, for the use of re the resources. But in the case of Syria, it hasn't been a problem so far for us. We've been able to uh, uh, get very regular uh, data, patient data information and so on, we're very comfortable with what we're doing. But the major dilemma we face is actually the transfer of risk. What does it mean to decide that you're going to stay in your country, you're going to send drugs because it's too dangerous for your own people, whereas the Syrian themse themselves, they, it's okay for them to take risk. And as an organization, it's a very difficult decision to make for us. This is why we've decided that a mix of both is much more acceptable than just staying uh, away from the crisis and trying to uh, just help those who are ready to take those, uh, those risks. Um, the, uh, you, I think you were, you were right to raise the uh, Iraqi situation and the Kurdistan, but we, we are working in two uh, camps uh, at, the, at the border between uh, uh, Syria and Iraq at the moment, in Domiz and uh, Dohuk. And uh, sadly enough, the, those camps, I think, are victim of their own success because they are doing so well, the, the, the refugees have been uh, the organization is so good that we have actually, it's, and it's certainly the first time since we've been responding to this crisis, we only had to focus on medical care. We were not asked to do much more than it. The rest was taken care of. So I think uh, your, your point is, uh, is very important because we should not forget that there is a permanent influx of people crossing into Iraq, that those camps are stretched definitely, and that they, 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 they need uh, to get attention and support in order to be able to, uh, uh, to absorb this influx and maintain their support. Now, regarding the absorption, uh, you raised the question about our NGOs who are asking for more money able to absorb uh, all this um, funding and do a better job. Uh, I, I think it's a, really, it's a real good point, and uh, clearly in, inside Syria, uh, it's not a financial issue, it's an issue of access. If we were able to get better access, we could, ups we could do much more from a, an operational standpoint. Uh, as an organization, we could rent, run 10 hospitals instead of six. Of course, it would not cover all the needs, but we could definitely do more if we had more, uh, more ability to, uh, to operate. So inside Syria, I think the main issue is really about getting a better access and a better respect for health facilities and humanitarian assistance. Outside Syria, uh, the, you don't have the same security issues, so there is a greater capacity to, uh, to operate, but the issue as we see it at the moment is really an issue of organization. And how can we organize this aid? How can we make it more efficient is really a big deal. Um, we, we are constrained financially, although MSF does not uh, seek uh, and use government funding for the Syrian crisis. We only uh, run our programs with private money. It's an institutional decision that we've made. But we also recognize that as soon as the government st funding started to uh, uh, operate and there was more actors on the ground, it was a relief for us as well. We felt less lonely and we were able to concentrate more on medical care and less on water and sanitation and shelter and so on. So clearly for us, seeing governments um, deploying more financial resources to this crisis has an indirect impact on our own ability to do our work. Otherwise, we, need to, we, we have too much to cover and we just can't respond to all the needs. Thank you. Um, we're getting to the end of our time now. Um, this has been, uh, I think, a really rich and interesting discussion. It shows that we are at this uncertain potential transition moment. As we've been reminded, there's a ferocious war still ongoing, catastrophic human crisis that is only partially, it's only possible to partially address right now. 
but we've heard also that there may be a window, there may be a, an opening that could play off of the chemical weapons framework agreement possibly, that could play off of the World Bank and others getting into blended investments to stabilize the situation in Jordan and Lebanon, perhaps a broadening of the debate around what the U.S. national interests are in this situation, and measures that we've heard about, and several measures from Rob, from Zahir, from Sophie about ways of, ways of increasing capacity and access on an incremental basis to, to, to can keep pushing. So I think this is uh, obviously still uh, highly uncertain and to be watched and we'll have to pull together again in the, in, the, in the near to medium turn to revisit some of these issues as they evolve. But please, please join me in thanking these four terrific speakers. Thank you. We're adjourned. <laughs>